Israel has disobeyed God by refusing to enter the land of Canaan. But today they rebel against God's order as well, as they accuse Aaron and Moses. On The Bible Brief. Pick up your Bible and read along with us today. Learning happens better with a Bible in your hand. God has meted out His judgment on the people of Israel. They rebelled at Kadesh on the border of Canaan, and He met their rebellion with a judgment. Everyone numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward would not be allowed to enter the land. Instead, they would die in the wilderness. The lack of trust in God and in God's power to help them take the land of Canaan was a serious case of unbelief. An unbelief that characterized the nation of Israel in the wilderness. They had seen God's numerous miracles in battle and in provision. And yet they didn't consider that those miracles could continue as they entered the land to drive out its inhabitants. Only Joshua and Caleb resisted the crowd's unbelief. And for their faith, God would allow them to enter the land long ago promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God had spoken. His judgment was delivered. And his mind was sure. But even in this judgment, the people rebelled against God. Instead of submitting to God's sentence upon them, they actually try to enter the land and to begin fighting for it, only to suffer an embarrassing defeat. The task was impossible without God's presence. The people of the land were indeed large and in cities that were strong, but God is bigger and stronger. If they had done things God's way, it would have meant certain victory. But in going their own way, it meant certain defeat. God's judgment was sure. Israel was to be in the wilderness for 40 years. It's here at Kadesh that Israel will spend a significant portion of this 40 years, mere miles from Canaan, looking upon a land that they couldn't enter. But this generation's rebellion against God isn't quite finished. There's still yet one major episode of rebellion, but this time it concerns Aaron more so than Moses. Now this will require perhaps a bit more background material to appreciate to the full. So let's discover a bit more about the priesthood in Israel that will be useful to us as we see this final act of rebellion from this generation of Israelites. Among the twelve tribes of Israel, God had separated out the tribe of Levi for a special service to him. This tribe would have duties associated with the tabernacle tent, where formal worship and sacrifices were done before God. But within the tribe of Levi, there were divisions of duties at the tent, and those duties were divided based upon lineage. Levi, one of those twelve sons of Jacob, had three sons, Gershon, Merari, and Kohath. And the duties at the tabernacle were divided among the descendants of these three sons. The Gershonites from the son Gershon cared for the tabernacle tent itself. The Merarites from the son Merari cared for all the supporting structures of the tent. And the Kohathites from the son Kohath cared for all the tools for worship and sacrifice, especially the Ark of the Covenant. So three sons of Levi and their descendants had unique roles at the tabernacle tent. Well, Moses and Aaron were from that third son we mentioned, Kohath. Moses and Aaron were Kohathites, and there were other Kohathites too. But from among the Kohathites, God specifically calls out Aaron and his sons to be the priests in the tabernacle tent. They were differentiated from all the other Levites because they were the ones who could conduct the services of the tabernacle, who performed the atonement-covering sacrifices, and who could enter the holy places of the tent where no one else could go. This differentiated Aaron and his sons from the other Levites. Aaron and his sons were the priests. Okay to review. Levi had three sons, and each of those sons had descendants that had special duties at the tabernacle. But Aaron and his sons had the special duties of the priesthood in the tent. Now we have the context 
to understand the final rebellion of this generation. Let's begin reading in Numbers chapter 16. Now Korah, one of the descendants of Kohath, son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moses with a number of the people of Israel, two hundred and fifty chiefs of the congregation, chosen from the assembly, well-known men. They assembled themselves together against Moses and against Aaron and said to them, You have gone too far, for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Korah and his associates have had enough of Moses and Aaron, but especially Aaron. Korah bemoans the fact that Aaron has this special duty of high priest, and he argues that all of the tribe of Levi and perhaps all of Israel is holy and set apart to the Lord. Korah suggests that because the Lord has been among all of them, that they are all qualified to serve in any role. In different words, he says, You, Moses, and you, Aaron, what makes you special that you lead us and you serve as high priest in the tent? After Korah's speech, Moses knows what's coming, and he knows that the Lord will be displeased at this presumption of Korah and his associates. They have forgotten that Aaron and Moses did not pick their roles. They were assigned to their roles by God himself. In rebelling against them, Korah and the others were rebelling against God himself. And Moses decides to prove this with a test. A test involving censers, which were vessels used to burn incense in the tent. This is the reaction of Moses, along with the test he proposes. When Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he said to Korah and all his company, In the morning the Lord will show who is his, and who is holy, and will bring him near to him. The one whom he chooses, he will bring near to him. Do this. Take censers, Korah and all of his company. Put fire in them, and put incense on them before the Lord tomorrow. And the man whom the Lord chooses shall be the Holy One. You have gone too far, sons of Levi. And Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it too small a thing for you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel, to bring you near to himself, to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to minister to them, and that he has brought you near him, and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you? And would you seek the priesthood also? Therefore, it is against the Lord that you and all your company have gathered together. What is Aaron that you grumble against him? Moses turns the words of Korah back upon all those seeking to usurp the authority and duties of Aaron in the priesthood. He says in effect, It's not Aaron nor I who have gone too far. It's you who have gone too far to presume upon God in this manner. And so he proposes a simple test. He says, Okay, why don't you rebels take censers and burn incense before Yahweh tomorrow? We'll see who he accepts, Aaron or you. Moses already knows the answer, but these stiff-necked Israelites only seem to learn the hard way. The next day we read, So every man took his censer and put fire in them, and laid incense on them, and stood at the entrance of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the entrance of the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. And they fell on their faces and said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin, and will you be angry with all the congregation? And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Say to the congregation, Get away from the dwelling of Korah and the other rebels. Despite the night to think it over, Korah and the others show up at the tabernacle tent the next day with censers, incense and all. They are in direct rebellion against God's order for the tent and for the priesthood. They have taken a role not theirs, and in doing so they have directly disobeyed the law that God had given Israel. And after Moses and Aaron plead with God, God directs his judgment to the people directly responsible for this rebellion. Something big is about to happen. And Moses spoke to the congregation, saying, 
Depart, please, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest you be swept away with all their sins. So they got away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents, together with their wives, their sons, and their little ones. And Moses said, Hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, and that it has not been of my own accord. If these men die as all men die, or if they are visited by the fate of all mankind, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates something new, and the ground opens up its mouth, and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they shall go down alive into Sheol, the place of the dead, then you shall know that these men have displeased the Lord. And as soon as he had finished speaking all these words, the ground under them split apart. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their goods. And so they and all that belonged to them went down alive into Sheol, the place of the dead. And the earth closed over them, and they perished from the midst of the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, and they said, Lest the earth swallow us up. And fire came out from the Lord and consumed the two hundred and fifty men, offering the incense. We shouldn't miss God's use of irony here. Remember the ten spies who gave a bad report about the land of Canaan? They came back and said that the land devours its inhabitants, and with their speech they inspired fear among the people of Israel. Well, the irony is that God used their lie about the land of Canaan and used it as a judgment here for disobedience. Obedience would have meant a land flowing with milk and honey. But here it's disobedience that causes the land to devour the people upon it. God has swiftly dealt with Korah and the other rebels. But even with the apparent judgment of God, the people still grumble against Moses and Aaron. It's as if they simply won't understand that God means what God says, and he will judge those who do not obey. The next day the people grumble again, and blame Aaron and Moses for the deaths of Korah and the others. But God hears even this complaining and sends a plague upon Israel that begins to kill those complaining in the camp. The only one who could stop it was the one who God had chosen as the high priest of Israel. Only Aaron could stop it. Moses said to Aaron, Take your censer and put fire in it from the altar, and lay incense on it and carry it quickly to the congregation and make atonement for them. For wrath has gone out from the Lord, the plague has begun. And so Aaron took it, as Moses said, and ran into the midst of the assembly. And behold, the plague had already begun among the people, and he put on the incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stopped. Now those who died in the plague were 14,700, besides those who died in the affair of Korah. And Aaron returned to Moses at the entrance of the tent of meeting, when the plague was stopped. Nearly 15,000 people died because of their disobedience to God's order and their accusations against Moses and Aaron. This generation has seen death and destruction throughout their wilderness wanderings, when obedience would have brought them blessing and peace with God. Despite seeing God's power time and time again, rebellion was in their hearts and no amount of laws could remove it. No amount of animal sacrifices could cure it. By and large, these people had gone the way of Pharaoh and received plagues as recompense. They did not obey, they hardened their hearts. And with this final rebellion, they would live out their remaining days during 40 years in the wilderness. But maybe, Just maybe, their children saw all these plagues upon Israel. Maybe they saw the consequences of rebellion. Maybe they would succeed where their parents had failed. Maybe where their parents were faithless, they would be faithful. Each person in each generation has a choice. Believe God and obey, or reject God and rebel. What will they choose? What will you choose? Join us next time as we meet the next generation, the generation who will finally enter the land of Canaan. 
The Bible Brief is brought to you by the Bible Literacy Foundation, dedicated to helping people like you learn the Bible. Copyright Bible Literacy Foundation 2023